Welcome everybody to uh, this next session. So we'll uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about biology and human health. We've heard a lot about materials and semiconductors, and so this is definitely going to be um, a challenge for some to follow, but we have tried to uh, make it as accessible as possible. So um, why are we here? Why are we excited about um, um, MIT Nano. So I'll give you a quick overview of what, what we go through the next 50 minutes. Basically, um, i give a quick overview of the facility that we use. And then we have uh, three vignettes of science that is enabled by, by these tools that we can access in, in the nano building. And so I'm going to talk about my research field, which is nuclear pore complex and, and recent developments that got us excited about HIV in context of the nuclear pore complex. And then my colleague, uh, Seychelle Foss from the bio department will talk about the genome. And then Joey Davis will talk about how dynamics play an important role in, these, um, in the imaging that we do with these uh, tools in MIT Nano. So why, why, why is MIT Nano important for us? We basically are in, in biology, an important element of biology is to understand the structure of biological ma macromolecules. And so these, these are proteins, DNA, RNA, and to, lipids, and to an extent, sugars. And essentially, we think that once we know the structure of something, we can explain the function of these molecules in the best possible way. And so we want to get to high resolution structure, essentially to atomic resolution structure of these, of these molecules. And it turns out that cryoEM is an incredibly good method for this. Um, only since basically 2013, because then detectors in cryoelectron microscopy became way better than before, and it made cryoEM accessible for the study of many, many different molecules. We call this the um, resolution revolution. And so in order to enable the resolution revolution, we had to figure out a way to get these high-end microscopes to MIT. And so for that, MIT Nano was fantastic because in order to install such high-end uh, electron microscopes, cryem electron microscopes, you need a space that is incredibly silent needs to have very good vibrational control, um, um, mediation, and electromagnetic shielding. And so MIT Nano is basically the only place on campus and also in Cambridge that can actually do this. So, so the, the instruments that we use are transmission electron microscopes. This is our high-end microscope, 300 kV, Titan Krios. A 200 kV instrument, and then we have a cryofib mill with which we can um, thin samples into thin slices, which we need to do in order for the imaging to uh, be able, because you cannot penetrate thick samples like tissue, for example, which as a biologist we would like to see, but we can't. So we have to mill those. And so we have all of these toys. They are all in the basement of, of, the, of the nano building. Um, we opened this in 2018. Um, we have uh, uh, professionally staffed um, um, facility with PhD scientists, and now after COVID and all of, the, all of the problems that we had at the beginning, we now have really a lot of users, including MIT externals and, and also companies. And so the publications are just uh, coming in. Of course, many of them are high impact uh, um, um, papers because you know these are the toys with which we can actually enable the most exciting science and excites us, excites MIT Nano, excites um, the president of, of Korea who visited the facility in um, beginning of the year. So, okay, so I am interested in a nuclear pore complex. What is this? In our cells and human cells, we have a separation between the genome and everything else. So we have a cell, a nucleus, and the nucleus is surrounded by a um, double lipid bilayer and therefore shielded from everything else. And so now you have created a huge problem because, because um, you have to transcribe the DNA, 
make mRNA, the mRNA has to be translated into protein. This happens in the cytoplasm, and so you now have to bring every mRNA molecule out of the cell, and then you have to bring all the produced proteins that need to be in the nucleus back into the nucleus. And so you have to then um, have a way to penetrate this membrane, and the way this is done is by one single channel, which is called the nuclear pore complex, which sits in these circular openings in a nuclear envelope, and that essentially facilitates all of this transport that, uh, that happens. And so um, we were fascinated in, fascinated in understanding this machine, right? But so this is this huge machine um, constructed out of 500 proteins, has 100 nanometer diameter, so in biological terms, really gigantic. So the way this principally works, if you dumb it down to the most uh, simplistic way, you basically can say this is, this is just built uh, as a scaffold that sits on that membrane. And then from that scaffold, you have disordered proteins that have a signature of phenylalanine glycine, two amino acids, with which it forms a mesh. It's basically jelly. And so that, that seals uh, the, the nuclear pore complex and forms a permeability barrier or condensate. And so the way this essentially works is if you have a small protein, smaller than four nanometers, they can simply diffuse through this. So, so there is no bar for those it's no barrier. But once you hit that size barrier of about four nanometers, you need to have a facilitator to go through. And the facilitators are called nuclear transport receptors, here shown in green, they can facilitate either the import or the export of proteins across this membrane in a, in, in, in a directional manner. There's energy involved that brings that through a small GTPS RAN that um, directs this, uh, this, this transport either to the outside or to the inside. And, and, uh, and the purpose of these nuclear transport receptors is essentially to mesh with this FG gel. They can partition into it, and so therefore they can facilitate the transport. And so we then were interested in how to solve the structure of this, and this started in 2000, so there was no cryo-EM. So what, what we did at the time is that we figured out that this large complex is organized into subcomplexes that we could biochemically characterize. And so then at the time, we did this with a technology called X-ray crystallography. And we then thought, OK, so let's see whether we can get the structures of these individual subcomplexes. And then with some low resolution technology, like cryo-M at the time, find out a way to bring everything together into a composite structure. And so, okay, after 15 years or so, we had a structure of the largest subcomplex called the Y complex. And you can see why it's called that way, built out of uh, seven to 10 mem uh, individual proteins. And they form this um, relatively large structure. And you can see it in all its beauty of, of helices and beta sheets that string this thing together. And then, there is uh, cryo-M data um, at the time, so this is 10 years ago, relatively low resolution, but since we had such a large structure, it, it was still enough to basically get some basic idea about the architecture, and that means like we could see in this, in this structure that there are two, com two rings of eight such Y-complexes stacked on top of each other, and they would form this, what we call the cytoplasmic ring, and on the other side, there's an uh, ring that looks very similar, and in the middle is a third ring called um, inner ring, and that is composed of other proteins. All right, fine. So, so we were there, and then of course, you know, people tried to improve the resolution and improve the resolution over over the next few years, and so you can see more details of this. But then we thought, okay, so all of these structures are built from semi-purified nuclear pores. So they are taken out of the cell, they are, they are fractionated, and then imaged. That's what you were able to do at the time. But now we had a cryofib mill, and so therefore we could ask the question, how does this complex actually look like in, a, in an intact cell? And so this is what Anthony, postdoc in my lab, then um, embarked on doing. And so to do this, you need a cryofib mill. So with the cryofib mill, 
can take your individual cell frozen on a grid, cut through it so that a thin layer is left. Um, in a cartoon, looks like this. And so this thin layer we can then image in a, in a cryo-electron microscope and, and um, record a tomogram. So we did this. So you can see this, how this actually looks like. Looks like. And so now you can correct it. Um, and you will end up basically with, with a reconstructed tomogram in which you can see the, uh, the membrane and, and the pore opening. All right, so how does that then look like? So this is the structure that we got out of this. Looks on the surface very similar to what we had seen before. We can model again like two rings of eight Y complexes on both sides, cytoplasmic ring, nuclear ring, inner ring, inner ring, yet other proteins, but looks essentially similar. But if you now actually compare the two, you will notice a pretty significant difference. And that is that the nuclear pore complex, when visualized in intact cells, is, has a much bigger diameter than the ones that we had previously seen. So this was a huge surprise to us. Nobody expected this to have such a um, significant difference. And so we could analyze this further. We could basically then um, figure out that the, the diameter before was about 40 nanometers. Now our data suggests that this is about 60 nanometers. And it changes basically in this inner ring. OK. Who cares? Why is, why is, who cares about a larger pore? Most things that go through the nuclear pore complex are way smaller than this 40 or 60 nanometer um, opening. And so why, why, would, why do we care so much about this? So the dogma in the field was effectively made a lot of sense. The largest substrates that you can use that go through the pore are 39 nanometers fitted very well with this previous data. Um, now we saw that the, our pores are actually larger. And so then we thought, OK, what are sort of the largest things that need to go through the pore? And so that brought us to HIV. So HIV, and HIV infects, it dumps a nuclear a capsid, the well-known cone-shaped capsid, into the cytoplasm. And this is. 60 by 100 nanometers, 120 nanometers large. So obviously, this cannot go through the nuclear pore complex if the, di if, if the size limit is 40 nanometers. And so therefore, for all these years, the dogma in the field, when, when you look at the HIV life cycle, was that, OK, HIV infects, sheds its membrane. You have to, we have the capsid. The capsid makes it to the nuclear pore, then the, the RNA genome of, of the virus needs to be transcribed into DNA before it gets integrated, necessary step for, for the HIV virus uh, uh, to propagate. So since this cannot go through, somehow you have to take this capsid apart in the cytoplasm before it can go through. And this has generated a huge problem because basically the capsid is, in a way, a protection from the, our innate immune system. So we have detectors in the cytoplasm that would detect this RNA otherwise. And so it kind of didn't make too much sense that this would happen, but you know that's, that's what we thought. All right, so now with this new data, we then thought, OK, is this possible that it actually goes through? And so there was data that suggested so, because another lab did also cryo-electron tomography and showed that um, you can already see in this that this capsid can dock to pores. It doesn't show that it goes through, but it shows that it kind of sits there. And so we thought whether we can go one step further and, and figure out how the, how the HIV capsid can actually pass through the pore. And if you think back what I told you five minutes ago about how this hydrogel fills the pore. It's a very dense hydrogel, 100 mix per mil protein, which is a lot. So how is it possible that HIV can go through this when it essentially has a volume that's as large as the pore itself? 
And so we then asked ourselves, does it actually work like a nuclear transport receptor? Does it work as its own nuclear transport receptor, so to speak? Because you couldn't just fit another layer of protein around it, then it would be too big again. And so we teamed up with a group in, in Germany, in, in um, Göttingen, um, basically uh, the group of Dirk Görlich, he's the expert in, in understanding the FG hydrogel in, in the nuclear pore complex, essentially the best molecular condensate, the best understood molecular condensate there is. And so they had developed an assay where one can mimic the pore in a, in a test tube. So effectively, you can see here that with a specific nuclear porin, you can generate these droplets, which have properties like the nuclear pore complex. For example, inert proteins don't go in it, but once you attach a nuclear transport receptor to a cargo that in this case is GFP labeled, then you can see how it stains these, um, uh, these, uh, these droplets green. So meaning that it penetrates this, this um, this hydrogel. And so we then um, asked whether this works also with HIV mimetics. So we, we didn't use live virus, we used a vehicle. Essentially, we can reconstitute these capsids um, in, in, a, in, a, in a test tube. And so we could then um, test those, whether they could go into such gels. And sure enough, they behave basically the same way. So this is the exclusion marker doesn't go into these droplets. Once you add the, these, these uh, mimetics, they pass into the nuclear pore complex or in this hydrogel just the way a nuclear transport receptor does. So this is, um, so what this does is it basically changes this model of how our HIV infect cells. So instead of um, um, being dismantled before it passes the pore, now we suggest that it passes the pore in intact form or at least makes it into the NPC, and it may be uh, disintegrated inside the pore. We don't know this yet. This is certainly the next step that you want to understand is how it actually looks like in the pore. It seems to be elastic, and so potentially this could be very interesting to, to visualize. And so that, of course, we can do with these instruments that we now have. So this is what I wanted to tell you. These are people who did all of this work in my lab and in our collaborators' labs. And with that, I'll, I'll give it up to Seychelles. Hello, I'm really excited to be able to uh, present some of our work. Um, it's great that Thomas just talked about the nuclear pore complex. We care about what's actually inside of the nucleus and um, how that material is managed. So, all of our cells contain almost the exact same DNA sequence. However, they perform extremely different functions. So your brain cells, your liver cells, they're performing very distinct functions, but they have the same exact blueprint encoding for them. Um, I really love this uh, picture of a developing salamander. Here at the beginning of the development, all the cells look exactly the same, but as these cells grow and divide, you end up with this beautiful animal that has so many different types of cells that perform these very distinct functions. And my lab is interested in understanding how that happens and how that's regulated. How do we get specific genes made in specific cells to give them those identities? And so the central dogmas might be something that some of you encountered in uh, introductory biology. Um, this is what drives our work. So we all know that there's DNA inside of our nucleus. Um, that DNA needs to be converted into a molecule called RNA. And those RNAs will then be turned into specific proteins. And proteins are the workers in the cells. They determine what a cell's identity and fate are. And so we're really interested in this first step. How do we take that information from DNA and selectively make it into certain kinds of mRNAs that will then determine what that cell does? And so that process is regulated by a very special set of proteins called RNA polymerases. And they're able to read information out of the DNA and make these polymers of RNA. RNA polymerase has been studied for over the last 50 years, and you might think 50 years is a long time to be studying a single molecule, but we still don't understand a lot about how it's actually regulated and how it works. And so that's what my lab is trying to do, specifically in the context of the nucleus. This is an image, um, a cryo-electron uh, micrograph of a um, nucleus from a starfish. Um, what you can notice here is that it's very dense. All of these dense clusters you see are of the DNA inside of that nucleus. If you took the DNA out of one of your cells and you extended it end to end, it would be about two meters in length. 
and it has to fit into the nucleus, which is about 10 microns in diameter. That's the equivalent of taking a piece of fishing line from here and extending it to New Haven, Connecticut, and putting that into a soccer ball. And you can put that fishing line into a soccer ball. It's probably going to be a hot mess, and that's OK. In your cell, though, it needs to not be a hot mess, because if DNA gets damaged or broken, um, or if the wrong genes are made accessible, you're going to make the wrong proteins. And that can lead to things like cancer or childhood um, d developmental disorders. So in this nucleus, RNA polymerase needs to find the right piece of DNA in the right cell type and make the right mRNA out of it. And that's a really hard task. At the same time, the cell needs to be able to keep this DNA extremely compact in order to keep it inside of the nucleus and keep it protected from the rest of the cell. And so we're really, in our group, trying to understand how these two basically conflicting processes of compaction and organization are going with um, accessibility, so having the RNA polymerase actually going in and reading this. There are a lot of different ways that we could study this. Uh, in the last 20 years, a tremendous amount of work has been done to make uh, sequencing of DNA and RNA really accessible and affordable, and so a lot of groups go after that. Um, I, unfortunately, am a person who needs to see stuff to understand it, and so the, the way that we go about it is to use more of a visualization uh, system. Um, you could use light microscopy, and that's more on the micron scale. Um, we like to see angstrom, so a little bit smaller than everybody here in Nano. We need to be uh, 10 to the minus 10. That makes us happier. Um, and so my lab uses a combination of X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, and uh, Thomas just discussed cryo-electron tomography. And today I'm going to tell you a bit about how we use uh, cryo-EM to specifically look at the transcriptional apparatus and how it's regulated um, during a very important phase of the transcription process. So uh, I'm going to give you guys a brief introduction on transcription because there's an important part of how this is regulated. So RNA polymerases um, need to be brought to specific genes, and they're brought there by transcription factors who can read uh, specific uh, parts of the DNA that are called promoter elements. Once the polymerase gets recruited to a promoter, it begins to initially transcribe. It actually has to open up the DNA and then begin synthesizing an RNA. One fascinating part of uh, transcription, especially in higher eukaryotes like us, is that the polymerase pauses after transcribing about 25 to 100 base pairs. So very shortly after it escapes from the promoter region. And this seems very counterintuitive because our genes are on the order of about 20,000 base pairs. So th there's basically nothing there, and the polymerase just stops. Seems very crazy, and I'll go into a minute why, it, that, why we think that happens. Pausing is uh, the consequence of both the underlying DNA sequence as well as two protein factors that combine to the polymerase and kind of enforce that state. It does get released because you do need to make that mRNA, and that's uh, regulated by a, a specific protein called a kinase that can phosphorylate the proteins here and results in um, one of them uh, losing its affinity for the polymerase and then being exchanged for other factors that can cause the polymerase to then rapidly transcribe through the gene body. And so why pause? Why is this important? Um, it's a really important regulatory mechanism to make sure that only genes get transcribed when they're needed. And so it's used to regulate about 70% of the genes in our bodies, which is quite a bit. And it's used in diverse processes like heat shock. So when you guys get a fever, you need to turn on certain genes. Um, if you, again, have a, an illness, turning on specific genes to respond to, to that illness to kill the virus, uh, that needs to happen. Also, if, if you need to develop into an organism, differentiation is very much regulated um, by this pausing phenotype. And finally, it's a, such an important mechanism to regulate gene expression that viruses like HIV actually use pausing uh, to regulate when that gets expressed inside of our cells. So if we get HIV, um, it steals the host machinery, and one of the mechanisms that regulates when the HIV gets made is, is through this pausing phenotype. So, our lab likes to visualize things again at the angstrom level, and we do this through biochemical reconstitution. And so we purify all of our factors, and we can put them together to specifically look um, at transcription. Um, we purify our polymerase from pig thymus. We can make synthetic nucleic acids um, that we can assemble the polymerase on and then add in factors. And what's really cool nowadays is we can actually watch the active process of transcription. So we can take our test tube, our biochemical reaction, and put that um, on a grid, which I'll show you in a minute, um, and actually visualize that. So I'd like to give you a, a glimpse into the kind of experiments that we do before we end up seeing things at the atomic level. Um, we characterize things biochemically. And in this particular assay, what I'm showing you is that we have a, a fluorescently labeled RNA. Um, and with this RNA, the polymerase can assemble on it to a, a DNA substrate. And if we give it nucleotides, it can then take this RNA and actually extend it. So what you're looking at here is it's a denaturing acrylamide gel. And so RNAs that are longer will be 
um, impeded in their uh, progression into this, this matrix. And so this is a full-length transcript. Down here, we have actually a position with pausing. And so if we add our pausing factors, what we can see is that this pause position lasts for a longer period of time, and it takes the polymerase more time to get this fully extended product. So Bonnie Sue, who's a, a really fantastic PhD student in our lab, she saw these gels, and she was really excited because what you can see here is there are lots of different species. It's not that we have only one species. We have pausing species. We have fully elongated species. There's a lot of going on here. And she wanted to ask, can we actually visualize this whole spectrum of intermediates in this reaction using structural biology. Um, and so to do this, she used uh, cryo-electron microscopy, and she was successful, otherwise I would not be telling you guys the story today. But I'll show you the cool stuff she showed, figured out momentarily. So what's beautiful about cryo-EM in, um, in contrast to crystallography is that we can actually take um, a sample that's in solution. We don't need crystals. And to get crystals, you need to have a really homogeneous sample. In cryo-EM, we can have this massive heterogeneous um, mess, essentially, and be able to, to work with that. So we can take our sample here, and we can apply it to a, a grid. This grid is about three millimeters in uh, diameter. We apply the sample to the grid. Um, it's an aqueous sample, and uh, we wick away the excess solution, and then it gets rapidly plunged into liquid ethane so that the, um, the aqueous solution freezes um, in a vitreous state and not a, not a crystalline state, and that's really important for our subsequent uh, TM measurements. Um, then we put it inside this beautiful microscope here, like we have in the basement of Nano, our Creos, and we can actually visualize um, the proteins. So uh, we collect uh, images at different magnifications. This is actually what the TM grid looks at, a very uh, low magnification. And if you zoom in uh, to one of these holes, you can actually see protein sample. And this is what a real micrograph looks like. Um, it probably doesn't look all that phenomenal, but we're actually able to get unction level information out of that. And to do that, it requires a lot of uh, modern computational approaches. Um, and I'll first show you this part and then get into how we do that. So this is our sample. We hopefully have our proteins frozen in different conformations and in different uh, views, um, because we, need, we use a lot of averaging to actually get high resolution information. So what happens is the electron beam will pass through our sample, and we'll get a 2D projection of that uh, protein and however it's sitting in the ice at that particular moment. So if we take these images that we get, again, they look quite grainy, and now we simplify them into uh, colored circles. Each of these colored circles is a different view of our molecule. So if we're looking at it this way or this way or this way, um, and we pick these molecules out on the grid and then classify them by the different views, we can then amplify our signal by averaging them. And we can average in both 2D to get these very high resolution images here, or in 3D to get a volume of the molecule. And this has all been uh, made possible by a lot of machine learning algorithms. And Joey will tell you a little bit more about work his lab does um, on this front too, uh, to look at dynamics um, of 3D things. So Bonnie used this cryo-EM uh, platform to be able to look at pausing. And she was able to actually get a bunch of different states out of her data. I'm gonna show you two of those states because they're quite exciting, quite dramatic, and how the complex changes. So what you're looking at here um, in this gray color is the actual data. So that's the actual volume data that we get from one of these reconstructions. And the colored stuff in the middle is the model that we've built into that data. Um, and so here are two of the states that we were able to observe. And this factor, that's interesting, it's slid. Uh, <laughs> this factor here moves quite dramatically. It moves by about 50 angstroms. And to us, that's a major change. Um, usually proteins can move a little bit, but we see in our structure here that it has a, a dramatic rearrangement. So you might wonder, okay, cool, your factor move, why do you care so much about that? Um, for us, it's important um, for a number of reasons, but I'll, I'll show this now in a more simplified way. Here we're starting with our first position of this factor, and this is when it, it rotates. And so I hope that it's clear that this is quite a dramatic change here. And it's pulling away from the, the polymerase surface. The polymerase, sorry, is in, in gray here and the DNA is here in uh, blue and cyan. And so this factor is an important factor for actually causing the polymerase to pause. It's the one that acts as the break to kind of stop it on a particular sequence. And what we're seeing here is that this break seems to actually get released. So when it goes into this conformation, um, it no longer is able to stall the polymerase. And there's a lot of data that we have to really support that it, these two different conformations either support stopping the polymerase or allowing it to continue. And I'm not gonna go into that right now, but happy to discuss that um, at a later point if anyone's excited.
One other aspect about this massive rearrangement is it also um, affects reactivation. So when you're paused, you often need to have another factor bind to you to get reactivated if you're a polymerase. And so when we're in the state um, that is acting as the break or the pause state here, the reactivation factor actually can't bind. So I want to draw your attention to this part of the polymerase and pay attention to this blue region here. So this yellow factor is the one that reactivates, and if you look closely, it clashes with this blue factor when you have it in the braked position. So they can't both be accommodated on the surface of the polymerase when you have it in a, a stalled position. However, when we have this massive rearrangement, now where we're no longer braked, now this reactivation factor can actually bind to the polymerase and access the active site of it to restart it. And so this is really important in being able to go between being a paused complex versus uh, what we're now calling a poised state. Um, and this is all stuff that we've done in the basement of Nano on the microscopes, and we have three angstrom resolutions, so it's pretty amazing that we can see this really amazing diversity of, of molecules um, using cryo um, And so this is just a summary. We have this uh, pause state where we have the, the, the break on, and now we have this additional state that we've never observed before where actually the break gets released and the polymerase would be able to then escape and get into the gene body. So I'm just gonna briefly tell you guys one tiny other thing and then I'm gonna turn the time over to Joey. So cryo-EM right now is really being propelled by a lot of technological developments. And um, over the past 15 years or so, we've had tremendous developments both on the hardware side and the software side that have enabled us to get these high resolution structures and see things that we never thought we could see before. Um, however, cryo is not that easy in the sense of knowing where you should actually get pictures. So this is what our grids typically look like. Um, that's the sample. And as you can tell, there's a lot of uh, differences in, in how the grid looks. It's very hard to say, where should I image? Where's the high resolution information? Where is my protein going to be happiest um, when, I, when I freeze it? And so we've been working in collaboration with um, the IBM Watson Lab and um, researchers at the University of Michigan to address this problem to um, use uh, machine learning and um, a large neural network to be able to try to identify the best places on a grid um, to collect data. And just as a, a teaser here, um, this algorithm uh, performs extremely well. So this is just a comparison that we've done um, with 10 uh, cryo-EM users. And this is our algorithm uh, in orange versus the uh, typical user. And what you can see here is that our, uh, our algorithm is performing as well as our best user. So it really seems to do a good job in helping us identify the best places on a cryo-EM grid for imaging. Um, and why this is important is it helps accelerate uh, science in the sense we can collect more good data in a faster amount of time so more users can get on these scopes. They're very busy um, and this is a way that we can um, enable more access, make the technique more dem democratized, um, and I'll leave it there. So I'd like to thank my lab, um, particularly Bonnie, whose work I just presented, um, and all of you for your attention, and I'll turn it over to Joey. Uh, thank you everyone again for attending. And, um, Today I'm gonna to talk to you about some of my lab's work, primarily on image processing for some of the data that, um, that we saw from Thomas and Seychelles. Let me get these slides started. <clears throat> um, so I recognize that there are a number of people with sort of a physics background probably in the audience, and so I thought I would start with a quote from who I think is probably most biologists' favorite physicist, Richard Feynman. Um, this quote's actually from 1959, I believe. And it was, um, it was a discussion in, in this sort of famous lecture called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. <clears throat> and he has this sort of snarky intro where he says, you know, a lot of biologists come to me and, and I tell them, you know, you really should use more math to understand the natural world. And biologists turn around and said, you know, what you should really do as a physicist is make an electron microscope 100 times better. And if you could do that, I could just look at the natural world and figure out how it works. I don't need all this modeling. And so um, the sort of delta between 1959 and the 2013 that, that Thomas referenced earlier was really this sort of step change in an electron microscope that now allows us to directly observe molecules and understand how they're working. Up until we had this, um, what biologists typically relied on was a technique called elect uh, sorry, uh, X-ray crystallography. And the way that this works is that you isolate your sample from the cell. It could be a polymerase. It could be something else. Um, you put it in conditions where the molecule sort of finds contacts between one another in these lattices, and those lattices start to stabilize the complex all in the exact same conformation. So what's great about that is that if you now illuminate it with x-rays, everything's in the same orientation. You can integrate signal across the whole crystal and get high resolution information. The downside, of course, is that this is extremely rigid and static. 
And in reality, the molecules that drive life are not static. They're instead sort of dancing on this complex energy landscape. Right? They're moving, they're changing conformations, they're changing subunits, and they're going through all these dynamics to support life. I have uh, two young kids, and so I sort of think about dynamics a lot. Um, and one way that you might think about this is if you're thinking about trying to develop a drug to bind to a particular cleft on a molecule, you sort of look at the static picture and you say, oh, this looks relatively easy. I see the docking site. I know what the molecule needs to look like. And for people that have fed uh -huh. toddlers, okay. that is, in fact, much more difficult, right? There's a bunch of dynamics. There's all these motions that you don't necessarily appreciate when you look at the static image. But those are important for understanding how you actually get the molecule delivered. Uh -huh. OK, so. The other way you might approach this is to think about using deep learning techniques. And you know, this has sort of inundated everything that's going on in science, or these generative modeling approaches. And probably the most important for structural biology was developed by DeepMind um, in two variants called AlphaFold and AlphaFold2. And these have been extremely powerful um, in helping us go from primary sequences to folded protein structures. We can do this in silico. We can do it across entire genomes all in one go to understand what the folded proteome looks like. And so if you read the press reports, you might turn to this and say, oh, so why do we need to experimentally determine structures any longer? We can predict them. And at some level, that's true. Um, but it's really true for a small subset of the types of problems that we're interested in. And in part, that's because the training data that goes into this has come from X-ray crystallography. And that primarily focuses on small proteins that are static. And so just a sense of scale. So what I'm showing here are experimental, excuse me, experimental and predicted structures in blue and green. And it's remarkable, right? This is basically atomic level precision of prediction of a structure from this primary sequence. And you'd say, oh my god, it's all done. It's solved. Wonderful. So this is a typical prediction that might work. This is shown now on the screen. You know, it's on the order of 30 nanometers. This is a typical machine that operates in the cell on the same scale. Right, so this is the sort of thing that we can predict. This is a ribosome. This is what makes all the proteins in your cell. Um, and you can see that it is just a completely different scale. And this is the type of problem that we can't yet predict. Now, my hope is that we'll get there. But getting there is going to require a lot more data. And that's my belief, at least, is where cryo-EM is really going to be impactful, is generating the types of data that we need to be able to make predictions for these massive types of machines. All right, so Seychelles went through this. Um, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. But you can imagine um, one of the promises of electron microscopy is that you take a picture, and now you have a bunch of molecules all on the grid. OK, so you can segment those out. Again, the resolution is quite low. Right? There's a lot of noise for the amount of signal that you have. But the opportunity is that you're looking at individual molecules. Those can all be in their own conformations. And if they're all in their own conformations, potentially you can understand these dynamics. To get to res higher resolution, what we typically do is we average across them, again, either in 2D or 3D. And when you're doing averaging, implicitly, you're assuming that all the molecules are structurally homogeneous. Right? Just by saying that we're going to average things, we're saying we believe that they're the same. We know that that's not true. And so people make sort of trivial extensions to this idea by saying, well, instead of averaging to generate one structure, maybe I'll average to generate two structures. And now I need to infer both the sort of viewing orientation for the particle and then which one of these two classes it can go in. You can extend this and say, oh, maybe there's three, maybe there's four. The types of problems that my lab's interested in is understanding how big machines like the ribosome come together. Those are often composed of, say, 50 to 100 different subunits. And so you could ask the question, you know, is this actually going to scale? So we can work through that very quickly. If you had a, a, a system that just had two components, there's four states possible, right? Completely empty, one of each one bound, or both bound. You go to four components, this jumps to 16 states, six components, 64 states. And you go to the ribosome, you know, and you have this preposterous number. Now, of course, we don't necessarily expect that all of those will be populated. But just to give you a sense of the types of scales that we have to worry about, you know, this sort of k-means classification is never going to work. And so what my lab did was try to reframe this problem. We started thinking about, instead of trying to average to infer a voxel array, that is like the density map given a set of structures, Let's reframe the problem and start to think, could we use the data to learn a mapping function? OK, and the idea for this mapping function is that it would take a position in Cartesian coordinates, and it would map it to the electron density at that position. So the way you generate a structure, if you had such a function, is you basically rasterize through the box 
And as you rasterize through, you predict the density at each position, and you're going to slowly build up the structure. Okay. So out of the box, this doesn't really help things. You still have one set of data, and what comes back is one structure. You've now just sort of complicated the formalism before it because now you're learning a function instead of learning a density map directly. But if you start to think about this as a function, well, a function is a function. It can take inputs of Cartesian coordinates, but it could take another input, which might be a discrete class K. So now conditioned on what class you're in, you're gonna get back a different density map. You could take that further and say, well, it doesn't have to be discrete. Maybe it could be a continuous variable. So some position along a reaction coordinate and conditioned on that position, you could get back a different density map. Or, you know, the pie in the sky dream is that imagine that you have some multidimensional energy landscape conditioned on the position in that energy landscape, you'll get back a different 3D volume. So what's nice about this functional mapping is that it really naturally extends to handle heterogeneity. Okay, so how could one learn a function like this? And this is where we turn to deep learning. There's this sort of universal approximation theory, which says that if you have enough layers in a um, MLP, you can learn any mapping function provided the appropriate training data and the right types of inductive bias. And all the magic for deep learning is figuring out how to organize that information and organize the networks to learn the function you want to learn. And so at MIT, we we're fortunate to have incredible graduate students. And so actually Ellen Zhang was the first student in my lab that I sort of tasked with this problem. She had a very successful PhD and now has her own group at Princeton sort of continuing this work. So the way that this works is um, there's a one network, which is exactly what I described. We call it a decoder network. Its job is to take in some position um, and maybe some position on a, a multidimensional energy landscape, predict density, and then what we'll do is we'll measure, or we'll take the predicted density, compare that to the input image, and if they're the same, we tell the network you're fine, don't change at all, and if they're really different, we tell it to update its neural network weights and try to learn this function. So we're gonna pass the data to it over and over and over again until it learns to generate images that are as close as possible to the input image. To handle heterogeneity, we're then gonna add another network we call an encoder, and its job is to organize the images in what we call a latent space, which is some low dimensional space where it's organized by structure. So they're gonna get encoded. Based on where they're encoded, the decoder will generate an image, and this whole thing gets trained end to end. So the way that you would use this is that you pass all of your particles through these networks, train the networks, you give one final pass of the images, and they're gonna get projected into this low dimensional space, and here, this is organized by particle density. So the sort of yellows are higher density particles. So you can see for this data set, there's maybe a half dozen different major states. And then there's sort of substates between them that allow the molecule to uh, transition between these different states. And what's neat about this is that you can generate structures throughout it, right? So you can see these sort of discrete states, and you can also walk transitions sort of along it. It's a generative model, so we can make all the intermediates that were in the data. So how does this work? So we've done this on a bunch of different data sets now. This is called the spliceosome. This is one of the molecules um, that helps um, sort of modify mRNAs in your cell to allow them to be translated. Historically, it's been very hard to image and see structures of, in part because it undergoes large domain motions. So we don't know anything about the spliceosome, but we just took this data set, fed it to our tool we call TrioDragon, and what we were excited to see coming out of it was that now we could actually resolve the molecule and we can see these large domain motions, which are really these molecules in motion. Right, so I would say we are inferring the order of these structures. Right? We don't necessarily know how they're ordered because we have a static picture, but we have all the different pictures, and so you can use some rules of parsimony to try to put them in order. <clears throat> we can apply this to all sorts of different systems. As I mentioned, my lab's really interested in the ribosome, which performs translation in the cell. We can take a data set, again, project it into a low dimensional space, and then sample structures out of it where we can see these huge amounts of, of structural variation. So here I'm just showing four structures. Because this is generative, you can actually make you know, hundreds or thousands of structures out of it. And once you have these large numbers of structures, it allows you to do things like make more um, rigorous statistical inferences of interdependencies of different subunits. So, so why might that be important? When we want to think about how the machine's assembled, what we'd like to do is just look at the ensemble of all the assembly intermediates and say, how often do we see one subunit present conditioned on some other subunit present? And based on those conditional probabilities, we can sort of make arguments about whether one binds first versus one binding second. So here's how that would work. So for example, imagine you have these two structures. There's two elements. The, the details here don't matter. But just sort of look at them. You can see that there's a protein bound here called KSGA. 
There's an RNA helix here called helix 44. And if we look at all of our volumes, you can see that they're mutually exclusive. So if KSGA is present, helix 44 is not. And if helix 44 is present, KSGA is not. All right, so they're mutually exclusive. If one comes in, the other has to be displaced. If that one comes in, the other one has to be displaced. <clears throat> because we can do this computation, we can extend it to all the RNAs and all the helices in the cell, and you can start to build up um, these sort of directionality arrows that tell you some dependence. So there's a couple ways this can fall out, but one of them shows that this protein S3 is dependent on helix 35, and that's because the only time that we see S3 being occupied, helix 35 is also occupied. And the other quadrant is never occupied. Right, so there's a directionality to the order in which they have to be bound. <clears throat> there are others that can bind independently. For example, this protein can bind, and this protein can bind independent of the others. So if you do that, now you can actually start to build up network diagrams that tell you how the construction of the machine is organized. Right, and so um, this may not be super striking to this audience, but if I show this to a ribosome group, this looks like what's called a Nomura assembly map, which was sort of a historically incredible experiment that was done in the 70s where uh, users independently pulled out particular ribosomal proteins and asked what the consequences of that were on assembly of the ribosome. They did this one by one across 30 or 40 subunits. Um, and what's really cool about cryo-EM is because we can look at the ensemble of structures, we can just compute that directly from seeing all of these structures, and it all comes out of one experiment instead of, you know, something on the order of like 20 human years. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, um, because I know we're going to do a little bit of Q&A at the end, is there's been a little bit of sleight of hand in what I've told you about these structures. So I've sort of said, we want to understand how the world works, and we want to understand how all these things come together. Uh, we're going to do that by growing up cells. We're going to lyse them with some detergent. We're going to run a bunch of columns and purify the complexes. And now I'm going to look at the distribution of structures that I see, and I'm going to tell you that that's the distribution that existed in the cell a week ago when I lysed them. You might say, I don't believe you, and, and that could be a reasonable assertion. And so what we'd really like to do is to look directly in the cell and see these things. And so Thomas mentioned this a little bit, but the way that we'll do that is using um, cryo-electron tomography. So again, you're going to grow cells. You're going to fib mill them to cut a thin slice to see through them, collect images at tilt angles, and then go and look at the individual molecules there. Okay, so um, we have a, the same version of CryoDragon. We have a tool that now works in tomography to do this. Um, where here, the amazing thing is that tomography is now allowing us to see sort of sub-nanometer resolution structures. So this is a ribosome that our tool is able to reconstruct directly out of cells. And I think the most remarkable thing about it is that the cells have been treated with chloramphenicol. So this is an antibiotic, it's a small molecule drug. And what we were able to see is we could find density for chloramphenicol. So this is a small molecule bound to its target, its mechanistic target of action in the cell directly imaged, right? So that's something on the order of a three and a half angstrom structure. Moreover, we can see dynamics so we can look across the ribosomes and we can see, you know, the details of this will probably be lost on this audience, but we can see different types of structures, whether they have subunits present or absent, helices in certain conformations. And the most exciting thing about this, to me at least, is we can now take these structures, map them back into the source tomograms, so you can see where all the structures live in the cell, Oops. and then, you know, you can start to actually look through the volumes and you can ask questions about, if I see a ribosome in this conformation, is it more likely to be adjacent to some other thing in the cell? And that might tell you something about interactions between these complexes. All right, so with that, I want to thank the folks in my lab that did this work. So again, Ellen Zhang sort of started all of this work. Ah, oh, there she is. Ellen Zhang sort of started all this work in my lab, and then it's been continued by Laurel Kinman, and Barrett Powell is a fantastic student who did all the tomographic work I showed. And happy to take questions. <laughs> but I don't know how we're doing that. <laughs> Depends if there are questions in the pigeon hole, then we can field those. If there are questions from the audience, we can field those. Or we can, um, I guess we have exhausted everybody. <laughs> How the next stage of the cryo-EM gets better? Uh, what is 
Yeah, so I'm mostly excited about the in situ work of being able to do tomography. So right now, it's extremely labor intensive to cut these individual lamella. Um, and so that being, ends up being extremely slow. You can only look at maybe, I don't know, um, on a good day, like five or six lamella and maybe 10 or 12 of those end up being good tilt series. Um, and so if we could increase the throughput of that tenfold, I think it would really open up the doors to doing this in a more systematic way. And there's a couple instruments coming online that should enable that um, for the low, low price of $6 million. So. <laughs>